So I started a nonprofit, and I run an expedition business. Pretty unrelated things. But about 10 years ago, I was asked to produce an IMAX film in Mongolia. So I gathered some things. A crew of people and headed out to Mongolia to do a scouting, run all the logistics. And during my time in Mongolia, as we moved through areas, we would stay with, excuse me, there we go, local nomads and their gear, these round felt houses. And one evening in a valley very similar to this, um, we were woken up in the middle of the night by a bunch of noise. A pack of wolves had come into this valley and they were preying upon the livestock in the community. In the morning, when we got up, we found that in that evening, 17 horses and over 30 of their other livestock were killed in one night. So I'm a scientist by training, and I started crunching numbers and thinking, okay, well, how is this possible? How can people function in a marginal environment like Mongolia, it's one of the coldest places in the world, and lose over 1% of their livelihood in one evening? And of course, I immediately thought, well, how can I fix it? Well, looking closer at this, I, come, I came to find out that historically, these people used to keep what's called a livestock guardian dog. These are great big dogs, quite fierce, um, athletic, um, to protect the sheep. Their dog was called the banghor, like this, um, which means flat face. But this dog seems to have gone missing in some period. But I thought to myself, I'm like, okay, if this dog is missing or rare, would it be possible to find it, gather them together, breed them, and give them back to the nomads? Seemed like a simple thing to me. Of course, nothing simple. But evidence shows that the use of these dogs reduces livestock losses by 80 to 100%. That's pretty massive for people that are barely hanging on as it is and losing their way of life because it's so hard to function. So it seemed to me like a very Mongolian solution to a Mongolian problem based on Mongolian traditions. So I went with it, that's all I can say. Just do it kind of idea. Um, but of course, ideas are easy. So thinking through things, figuring out what hurdles there were, I came up with a list and figured out if I could get by them. Number one, the dog. Okay, how rare was it? Well, it turns out it's very rare. During the Soviet occupation from the 20s to the 90s, it was pretty much wiped out. It was too fierce. When they relocated the nomads into settlements, uh, the dog was just too fierce. They also, for a while, were fashionable coats in Moscow, so the big ones were all killed. Pretty crazy. Um, the second hurdle that I was thinking about is, okay, well, who am I to come into some community and say, okay, here's your solution, okay? That just doesn't fly. If I don't have the community and the grassroots with me, it's not gonna work. So I wasn't sure if I'd be able to get by that. Well, I love harsh, bad places, love them. I used to live in Beirut, wherever he went. Um, and uh, I looked at, at the harshness and the distance to Mongolia and saw that as a major impediment. It would be much harder if I didn't have people on the ground, much more complex. And of course, the all-reaching funding. How was I gonna pay for this? Well, of course, I ended up, obviously I'm here, being able to pay for it. But as I looked more closely at the things that I thought were in my way, it turns out that they weren't really in my way. Only one was, and it remains in my way, and that's funding, but that's just a constant battle. But I talked to village elders and the herdsmen, and they knew this dog. This was nothing new. This was not reinventing the wheel. This dog was their grandfather's grandfather's dog that did this. So they were totally ecstatic about the idea, which was huge for me to get them what I thought on my side. I also met with other conservation groups to figure out, okay, is anybody else that's working out there on a project similar enough to this that I could kind of bypass a bit of a learning curve and work with them? They were all ecstatic, international as well as within Mongolia. So that was out of the way. Getting a dog, that was a bit more difficult. I'd been back and forth to Mongolia for the IMAX shoot five or six times, but I actually took a separate trip, brought my family, we did an expedition through Mongolia and found pockets in these isolated areas where this dog existed. I thought fairly confidently that we'd be able to get a good breeding group, so that was good. And then through a little tenacity, I gathered enough of a seed fund to get us to where we are literally today, which is about three years of work so far. 
So, again, I went with it. I took a young employee of mine, and I sent him to Mongolia. This is Doug Lally. He's a gypsy-spirited adventure addict like I am. And basically, he hit Mongolia running to get this project going. We didn't really have any idea where we were going or what we were doing. But within the first year, working closely with the Canine Institute of Biology, Cornell University, we sampled DNA of these pockets of populations to determine if these dogs were isolated populations. Um, in other words, was there any kind of support for keeping modern breeds out of the molecular makeup of these, these dogs? And also, we wanted to see if the dogs we choose were related or not to avoid inbreeding. Well, great results. They are isolated, and we had plenty of, of uh, genetic diversity to go forward with. So that was all great. We got 10 dogs, and of course, 10 dogs, they're big dogs, you have to keep them somewhere. So we started building kennels. We found some land that somebody leased us for almost nothing, another person very interested in this, and we built the kennels. Now the kennels, as you can see, they're not some little kennel that you bring your dog to on the weekend. These are about 150 feet by about 75 feet, and high fences to keep the large dogs in. But the main reason these kennels are so big is that we raise these puppies with a flock of sheep. So sheep live inside these kennels with the dogs. And it's these sheep, and as the puppies grow up with them from day one up through at least three or four years old, the puppies bond to these animals, just like your dog bonds to you at home. It's submissive to you, but it protects your house, and it protects you. Here's a great picture of a puppy that's showing perfect behavior when a sheep approaches him. It's basically saying, I'm not a threat, don't worry about me, I'm part of your, your flock, we're good to go. So all this comes into the process and the planning, and of course we're processing and planning at the same time. So I grabbed another one of my uh, gypsy-spirited guys, uh, Devin Byrne here on the left, and I sent him to Mongolia just at the end of this year to work with Doug to finalize the construction of the breeding facility, and they did that. They got everything finished up, they paired off the dogs that we had, 10, and now, at this state, we can house 20 dogs with their prerequisite sheep, and we have a hotshot young Mongolian guy that is outstanding and totally into what we're doing, taking care of the dogs on a daily basis, making sure they're bonding and vet care, et cetera. Um, and just recently, we were joined by 19 of these guys. Now, who doesn't want to go to Mongolia and collect puppies, okay? Um, it's, a, it's a great thing to do. But 19 puppies, you can't keep them forever, okay? So while we raise them with sheep, we need to get them out there and in the hands of the people that should have them. So as we speak, literally right now and in the next three weeks, we are placing our dogs in these three different locations. In the north, Terrell's National Park has partnered with us to place dogs there. Central region, Hustai National Park, where the Przewalski horses are the only horses, the ancient horses alive live there. They are partnering with us. And down south, the Snow Leopard Trust and uh, my group are working very closely in the Gobi. Now, the interesting thing, and it's just by chance, is these three locations, there we go, um, are ecologically very different. In the north, it's typical boreal taiga forest. This day I took this picture, it was negative 37 below zero. This area is recorded 57 below zero. So it's a nasty place, but it's beautiful. In the center of the country, near Hustai, it's classic Asian belt grassland steppes where most of the Mongo Mongolian nomads dwell. And down south, the Gobi Desert and the mountains are amazing. And this picture is quite amazing. This picture was taken just a few months ago by an automatic camera owned by the Snow Leopard Trust. And what it's showing is a couple of cubs playing with each other. But for me, the most amazing part of this picture is that this area is not far from where we're putting our first puppies. So our puppies are gonna grow up with these cubs. And our puppies, hopefully, will be protecting the flock that these guys wanna eat. And hopefully they do their job because what happens if they don't do their job? These guys get killed by retribution killing. So it's pretty linear. It's Newtonian, as we learned today. So I'm all over it, though. I think it's quite cool. So 
Where do we actually place the pups? Not only regionally, like I showed you on the map, but with what individuals? And here we turn to the local elders, like this fellow here. The elders obviously have their finger on the pulse of the community. And with their help, we find out which individuals are able and willing to follow the protocol that we have, which is a three-year period of raising these dogs in a particular manner. Which ones need them the most, of course, um, and the elders in the community have gathered together, much to our surprise, but maybe it shouldn't have been, they're very enthusiastic because if it works with a few families, the rest of the community will get these dogs. And of course, that will basically sequester that area from predation. There's not a predator that's going to be stupid enough to go in there and try and eat something. Great. So, that's about where we are right now. But where do we go from here? Well, being a nerdy kind of biology kind of guy, we collect data. And the data we want to collect is hopefully going to allow us to work with other institutions to create a model of this system, although it's not unique, it's used around the world and, and proven, but use it at least inside Mongolia and other parts of Central Area, Asia, excuse me. Um, we need to quantify, obviously, are these dogs doing what they're supposed to be doing? Are they effective? When are they effective? How effective they are? they are and what conditions work best, et cetera, et cetera. And in a, a twist on this, Doug Lally is already co-author on a paper with Cornell University about the origins of the domestic dog, which is pretty interesting because he didn't write anything, but, but that's okay. Um, they used our data. Using our DNA data and many other sources of DNA data, they've shown that the DNA data supports the hypothesis of the dog being originated in Central Asia about 40,000 years ago. So I think it's very cool that we're looking at using these dogs that have co-evolved with humans over 40,000 years to protect their former prey from their ancestors. Another interesting aspect. But we also want to kind of exchange more information with other people. UC Davis has throwing us some students this summer and we'll continue to throw graduate students and postdocs. We'll work in parallel projects in the beginning, helping each other out. So that's fantastic. We're also developing, hopefully, some incentives, either with other conservation groups or by ourselves, that would allow the herders that have our dogs the ability to sell cashmere in a cruelty-free way because these dogs are non-lethal mode of predator protection. Um, etc. We're going to run some eco tour groups through here. My company, Overland Experts, this fall will be going to run an expedition through Mongolia and we will be working on the project as we have a blast there. And you guys can come if you want. Um, it's a pretty exciting thing to do. So I keep going back to the idea of community. The talk I have is the genius uh, associated with conservation, and community. But I can't stress it enough. Besides my two guys on the ground, which this would be absolutely impossible with them, and again, they're pictured there, um, it has been our experience that every turn that we take in this project has been a turn helped by some other group of people doing some other thing with other people. Constant connections everywhere. Pictured here is a Snow Leopard Trust people down in the Gobi. Um, but we've worked now to date with 15 separate institutions and helped them, hopefully, as well as they help us. We've worked with conservation groups, the local community and the elders, the individuals, of course, the donor community. Without the donations, we wouldn't have gotten anywhere. Um, it, and it keeps going. So I guess my take-home message for this is this project that I decided to start working on is pretty focused, okay? And I think that's very smart. If you want to do something, you do something that you're good at and you keep focused and you keep it simple and that's what we're doing. But there are other people doing that all around the world and of course right around us in Mongolia. If you can gather those people, it's the aggregate of all these little projects that make something great, all right? The genius of conservation is in community and cooperation. So in closing, if you guys are thinking about doing some kind of field work, it is fantastic, uh, especially if you can go to places that 
really want to kick your ass because it makes it more interesting. Um, and our plan now is to move forward. We're doing a crowdfunding event in a couple months, websites going up. So we're shooting to be exposed to you as much as possible. You got an idea, you figure out your hurdles, you do it, and you ask for help, and you give help. Pretty simple, I think. So that's it. That's all I've got. Thanks so much.